Noam Chomsky is a man for whom few of our listeners need an introduction. And in any case, doing a full introduction of one of the most influential writers and thinkers and social critics of the last hundred years would take most of our limited time together. So I'm going to dispense with all of that if that's okay with you, Noam. But let me just thank you for taking the time to chat a bit today. Pleased to be with you. So I've got two broad questions for you, but before I jump into those, I just wanted to set a little context. Uh, in the last season of the Crazy Town podcast, we explored some of the unrecognized and underappreciated watershed moments from human history that led us, at least in our view, to the societal and environmental crises that we face today and our general failure to respond to them. One of the moments that we discussed was the creation of the Powell Memo and the dominance of the neoliberal world order, which is a topic I'm sure you have a lot of familiarity with and lots of views about. But I wanted to get your thoughts on something very specific, which is a statement that was made by George Monbiot back in 2016, which I quote, neoliberalism's triumph also reflects the failure of the left. When laissez-faire economics led to catastrophe in 1929, Keynes devised a comprehensive economic theory to replace it. When Keynesian demand management hit the buffers in the 70s, there was an alternative ready, and that was neoliberalism. But when neoliberalism fell apart in 2008, there was nothing. This is why the zombie walks. The left and center have produced no new general framework of economic thought for 80 years, end quote. Monbiot goes on to argue that a return to Keynesian economics wouldn't work in any case for the realities that we face today, most especially the climate crisis. So Noam, I just wanted to start by asking if you agree with Monbiot's critique of the so-called left and if so, why do you believe there's been a failure to put forward any viable alternatives to neoliberalism or free market economics? I have a somewhat different view of the matter, both about the deeper questions of the nature and history of neoliberalism, which I think are misunderstood, hmm. but also about the specific question of a left alternative. I think there are pretty substantial left alternatives. They're not in the mainstream, but that's because of power systems. I mean, the Republican Party is off the spectrum. We can forget about them. Uh, the Democrats abandoned the working class in the 1970s, became a party of uh, affluent professionals, uh, Wall Street, uh, Clintonite. Democrats, the uh, kind of people who show up at Obama's parties and so on. Uh, so they're basically not an opposition party, except that in part they are the Sanders movement. So the Sanders movement, which is part of the, it's called the left, whatever that means, but it has put forth uh, pretty reasonable programs. Uh, They've all been killed by 100% Republican opposition, a couple of right-wing Democrats, uh, but the pr programs themselves are quite reasonable, moderately social democratic programs. Uh, but uh, there's much more than that. If you take, uh, say, the Political Economy Research Institute, major research institute, associated with the University of Massachusetts, directed by Gerald Epstein, Robert Pollan. They've done very extensive work, detailed work. It's, it's called kind of neo-Keynesian, heterodox neo-Keynesian, but it's part of a much larger movement. Uh, they have fine staff, uh, Nancy Fulbright, Jayati Ghosh, Dan Ellsberg, who remembers an economist by background, quite a substantial uh, work on ways to deal with the current crisis and specifically on climate change. They are in the lead in uh, developing detailed proposals 
as to how to deal feasibly with the problems of climate destruction, uh, working them out in extensive detail, and even applying them. So Bob uh, Pollan's work with uh, West Virginia miners, for example, Ohio mine, mining groups has led them to uh, take uh, pretty significant stands. The United Mine Workers, as a result of this work, has uh, adopted a transition program from coal to alternative energy with appropriate concerns for the miners who are being displaced, worked out in detail, mainly Holland's work, that picked up by a couple of dozen California uh, unions. This is not a particular innovation. We should remember that Tony Mazaki's uh, oil chemical atomic workers union was right in the forefront uh, 50 years ago of uh, pressing for the work on the environment. And Mazaki himself was a pretty left anti-capitalist environmentalist, went on to try to start a labor party in the Clinton years, didn't work. Well, all of this is there. It's not that there's no alternatives. Sensible alternatives worked out in extensive detail, applied in practice with some success, and in particular focused on the climate. That's the lead in the studies of climate change. There's no work that I know of comparable to Bob Pollan's on this. A lot of it's been reviewed in a joint book of errors, but mainly his work. So there's things there. It's of course there. You know, you're not going to read them in the headlines of the newspapers. Uh, you're not going to, uh, they won't be in, uh, they are actually discussed in Congress, but marginalized. So for example, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Martin have uh, a resolution in the Senate, Congress, both House and Senate, which uh, didn't reach uh, legislation because there's too much opposition, but it's there and it's the basic outline of a quite sensible uh, a climate program that the government could adopt and would deal with the essential issues and would be a way to mitigate the crisis and move on forward. So the things are there. What it takes is a large scale popular pressure to turn them into real implementation. I should also say that neoliberalism was discussed. Uh, the crisis of neoliberalism, its collapse was not in 2008. It was in 1982. That's when neoliberalism collapsed. When the, uh, on, uh, in uh, Chile, when the Pinochet government came into power, pushed into power by the United States, vicious, brutal dictatorship, it immediately opened the doors to the top neoliberal economists. They all flooded in there to run the economy. It was perfect for them. It was a vicious fascist dictatorship. There was no dissent. Nobody could, put, put, could say anything about it or they you know, get tossed into a torture chamber. So that was fine. Uh, it, uh, they had free run to run the economy. During the Allende years, there had been great pressures on the economy to try to undermine and destroy it. Uh, the United States, of course, and uh, the international institutions that it controlled. But they all flooded back in as soon as the dictatorship came. Plenty of investment. They were sensible enough. Oh, the so-called Chicago boys, students of Friedman and others came to run the economy with all the fine neoliberal principles, uh, perfect experimental conditions. Uh, they were smart enough not to privatize the main source of income for the economy. The Codelco, the world's largest copper producer, which had been nationalized 
that was very efficient. That was bringing in most of the funding for the economy. So they left that uh, in place. Perfect. You know, what could go wrong? Within about five years, they'd crashed the economy. Literally, it was uh, more of the economy was taken over by the state than under a yen did. Uh, people, economists who had their heads screwed on, you know, used to call it the Chicago Road to Socialism. Uh, <laughs> after that, they turned it back to the traditional rulers and they sort of ran an economy. So that's when neoliberalism crashed. Well, they didn't care. In fact, they uh, notice the fact that the that the neoliberals uh, love the dictatorship is nothing new. <laughs> They're all in favor of state violence. Uh, their, their guru, uh, Ludwig von Mises, back in the twenties, was a strong supporter of Mussolini. Said Mussolini's fascism had saved civilization by crushing lit workers, the labor movement by. Uh, destroying Austrian social democracy, of course, Italy too, and uh, save, just save civilization. Well, after the collapse in Chile, they moved on to bigger things. By then it was 1982, that's Reagan. So they moved on to try to, let's take over the world, you know, uh, under the Reaganite neoliberal programs. Well, were they a success? Depends who you ask. Uh, so there's, there's a good measure of their success, actually, studied by the Rand Corporation a couple of months ago, which uh, tried to calculate the what they call transfer of wealth from the lower 90% middle class, working class, to the very top, top 1% over the 40 years of neoliberalism. Now their estimate is close to $50 trillion. So that's a success. If you're on the very top, it's a wonderful success. If you're the rest of the population, it's a catastrophe. Uh, the real male wages are probably lower than they were in 1979. So let's tell the truth about neoliberalism. It's class war. Furthermore, the talk about the market it's mostly a joke. Mm -hmm. It's the market for the poor and the working class. It's massive state intervention for the rich and powerful. Uh, Bob Pollan and Jer Jerry Epstein have a study on this, which they call the bailout economy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, starting with Reagan, start with deregulation. First of all, there's enormous growth of the financial institutions. They immediately start crashing. You deregulate them, you get crashes. Started right away with Reagan, went through the, he left with a major collapse of the, uh, the, the uh, housing, uh, housing um, industry, huge crisis, all bailed out, each one worse than the last. And it went on until 2008, the worst of them all, where you had to have a huge government intervention Actually, if you look at that intervention, this is now under Obama, started with Bush, continued under Obama. Congress passed a legislation, TARP legislation, to overcome the, the serious crisis. It was almost at the level of uh, the Great Recession. Uh, so the Treasury moved in. They were supposed to overcome it. Well, the TARP legislation had two parts, two components. One of them was to bail out the perpetrators of the crisis, uh, the banks who had made predatory loans and cheating customers and dispersing them with uh, derivatives that were permitted by uh, the Clinton deregulation system. So nobody knew who owned one, except that they were making plenty of money out of it. So you had to bail them out. There was another part of the legislation to support the people who had suffered, the people who were thrown out of their homes with foreclosures and so on. Well, guess which part of the legislation was implemented? In fact, it was such a scandal that the Inspector General of the uh, Treasury Department 
Neil Borofsky wrote an angry book about it. Well, that's class war, that's neoliberalism. In fact, uh, uh, so, so, so it's the same thing with uh, all the slogans. So uh, Margaret Thatcher, there's no society, just individuals in the market, mm -hmm. with one exception, the rich and powerful. They have plenty of society, uh, trade associations, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, business round table, uh, people like Powell in the background. Uh, so they have a rich, complex society, but not the poor and the working class. In fact, the first moves of the Reagan and Thatcher administrations in modern neoliberalism were to attack and destroy the labor unions. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly in keeping with neoliberal principle. Back to Pinochet and uh, Mussolini, got to destroy labor. That's the one force that can defend people against class war. So first of all, let's be clear about what it is. It's not markets. You look at the institutions established under the neoliberal programs, like the World Trade Organization. It's called a free trade organization. It's highly protectionist, radical protectionism. That's why drug prices are far higher than they ought to be because of the extensive protectionism built into these investor right agreements, which masquerade as free trade agreements. So the free trade rhetoric is partially true. Markets for you poor guys can't do anything about it, but plenty of protection, powerful state for us. Uh, it's been it, it's been neoliberalism since the 1920s. And of course it's called very free. So Friedrich Hayek, for example, one of the gurus when he went to Chile under Pinochet, uh, came back and said that uh, every, he said literally, everyone he had spoken to said there was more freedom under Pinochet than under the Allende government. Uh, it tells you who he was speaking to. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, this is a constant strain that runs right through it. It takes a lot of effort to suppress it. So neoliberalism is rhetorically fraudulent class war. Its first crash was 1982 after perfect experimental conditions. It's now been applied to the rest of the world. We can see what it's like. Uh, that's a large part of the reason why there's such anger, resentment, uh, contempt for institutions, uh, a country like the United States is probably breaking up over mm -hmm. in Europe elsewhere. But I, going back to Montbiot, I think it's understandable what he says. That's the way it looks, sort of, from the mainstream view. But uh, there are perfectly clear alternatives, carefully worked out, applying specifically to the climate issue. That's the central focus of the work. It, places like Perry. I, um, I want to get back to those alternatives in a second, but I just want to, I guess I just want to name or flag that maybe there's a distinction between the failure of neoliberalism in terms of actually implementation, like in the case of Chile, right? Clear failure um, versus maybe not, not having failed quite yet in terms of uh, rhetoric and influence over institutions and kind of collective narrative and, and worldview beliefs around free markets and and all of that, right? And I would actually probably even disagree with Monbio that neoliberalism failed, you know, in the the Great Recession because over the last decade plus, it's not like it has gone away. Right in terms of its hold over, uh, you know, the halls of power and policy um, on the implementation or on the alternative side, uh, you know, I we don't have to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I think Mombio's argument a bit is that things like even though he wasn't referring specifically to the Green New Deal, 
but those kinds of policies are a bit neo-Keynesian in the sense that they're a bit around stoking consumption and production and uh, you know demand, right? In this case, for alternatives to to fossil fuels, which is all about still growing the economy, uh, and that you can't necessarily decouple environmental impact from that, even when you're building out "quote unquote" clean alternatives. Um, well, this is a little. Let's look at it more carefully. Okay. Uh, this. So let's take. Uh, uh, met transportation, a major contributor to uh, pollution and environmental destruction. Well, people aren't going to stay at home. Okay, so there's got to be transportation. The question is, what, what kind will it be? Will it be sitting alone in a SUV in a traffic jam? Or will it be efficient mass transportation? That's basically the choice. Well, if you have efficient mass transportation, that's growth. It's the growth of a mass transportation system, which reduces, which deals with the climate crisis by eliminating, not totally eliminating, can't do that, but by sharply reducing one of the main sources of uses of energy that are destroying the environment. Uh, suppose you build a, like I have, uh, I live in Arizona, sun's shining all the time. Hmm. You know, uh, when we moved in, we put up solar panels. Now you look around the neighborhood, there's no solar panels. That's liberal nonsense. So we don't pay anything for electricity. The neighbors complain about thousand dollar bills every month, but you can't put up solar panels. Okay, that's not, if you do put up solar panels, that's growth. In fact, not trivial growth if you look into the production of them. It's quite a substantial amount. But overall, it reduces uh, the use of energy and uh, is a step towards uh, dealing with the crisis. So I think it's not just growth or non-growth. It's what kind of growth? Do you have the kind of growth that uh, actually improves the society improves life and reduces uh, fossil fuels and uh, destruction of the environment, or do you have the kind of growth that exacerbates them? Uh, uh, you, you, we're not going to go back to a, a pre-industrial society. The question is how to deal feasibly with the reality that exists. This extends to agriculture uh, much more. The Green New Deal you know, covers a lot of names, a lot of ideas, but if you put it together sensibly, it's a realistic uh, uh, development of the economy on fundamentally social democratic lines. In my view, also Bob Pollan's and Jerry Epstein's, it should lead to more radical social change. Like there, it's, it's ludicrous that the, in order to get the, uh, the main uh, institutions that are destroying the world, in order to get them to stop doing it, we have to bribe them. Mm -hmm. Happens to be a fact. As the institutions now exist, you know, you're going to have to bribe them. We might wish it were different, but then we can try to make it different. But if you look at the time scales involved, you don't have that choice. The time scale involved in moving towards a really democratic uh, uh, economic system, popularly based, uh, workers controlling enterprises, communities controlling uh, their own enterprises. Well, that's a long way off. We can move towards it, but we have a very short time to deal with the existing crisis. And that has to be within the framework of existing institutions, like it or not. But there are feasible means, like Holland's estimates are maybe two to 3% of GDP, a fraction of what's 
spent in bailing out the financial institutions, uh, even from the COVID crisis, let alone mm-hmm. 2008. And there are plenty of other things that could be done if there's popular f- support for it. Like take 2009 again, after the Great Re- Recession, near Great Recession, uh, the uh, uh, Obama basically nationalized the uh, automobile industry. The government pretty much bought it out. Well, there were a couple of choices. One choice was return it to the former owners, maybe some new faces, but in class terms, the former owners, and have them return to what they were doing, namely produce more traffic jams. Uh, That's what was done. There was an alternative. You could have turned it over to the workers, communities, have them produce what's needed, like efficient mass transportation. It was pretty close to that. If there had been a popular movement supporting it, could have happened. Well, these things are not utopian. You know, they're within grasp. In fact, right now, for example, again, Bob Pollan done most of the work on this, has pointed out that the government could buy up the entire fossil fuel industry Hmm. and turn it to sustainable energy at a cost less than what the Treasury Department poured out to save the financial institutions after the COVID crisis. This is not far out utopianism. It's very well within reach. Well, a lack of ideas. So p- putting aside, you know, questions and debates about specific alternatives for a second, I mean, you said that um, those have existed. You, you sort of disagree with Mambio's characterization of that in that it really does come down to to power and influence, right? Um, and, and organizing. So I'm, I am curious about what your personal experience has been seeing this entire process unfold from, you know, the, in a sense, the, the implementation of Keynesian economics all the way through sort of the, the Reagan era, you know, um, to today, the lack of those alternatives gaining any real momentum. Um, I'm curious about what, what your experience of that process has been, but I'm also curious to hear from you. You said these are not utopian. So for example, nationalizing the fossil fuel sector, right? The energy sector um, is not utopian, but how, do we actually do that considering where we are politically and culturally in this country at this point, especially as things may get more fractured than they, than they even have been to this point? Well, first of all, I should make it clear that I'm not a big fan of nationalization. Mm-hmm. I think there's a much better answer. That is turn the fossil fuel industry over to its workforce. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that's actually what is pretty close to happening. Take, say, West Virginia again, mm-hmm. under the coal, coal industry. The proposals that Pollan was working out with, some, with the mine workers, in fact, were to transfer the control of the coal industry over to them, let them run the industry, close up the mines, move to develop uh, uh, sustainable alternatives, of course, with some federal support, though not huge, kind of considering the expenditures that are used for other things. Uh, So it's a kind of mixed story, uh, recognizing that we do live in a state capitalist economy. Can't throw that, can't wish that away, but you can move to dismantle it piece by piece, partially on the ground, partly at the national level. So uh, the reason why 
these uh, ideas are not front and center is uh, class war. Who holds the levers of power? Okay. Uh, they do what they want unless the population is organized to take that power away from them. Just let's go back to my childhood. I grew up during the 30s. Family was working class, mostly unemployed, uh, very hopeful, much poorer than today, but hmm. very hopeful because there was militant labor organizing. The labor unions were not only functioning, but functioning effectively was a sympathetic administration. They were able to push through very, very important changes, laid the basis for modern social democracy, battling all the way. Uh, can't go through the details, but the labor unions were more than just uh, uh, sit down strikes in the steel factories. It was also a culture, a life. Uh, my aunts who were garment workers, unemployed garment workers, were in the Ladies International Garment Workers Union, Ilgud. That meant uh, cultural activities, social activities, uh, a week in the Catskills, you know, it's, uh, it was a whole life, uh, not just political activity. Well, that's been very carefully destroyed. The business world is on a crusade constantly to destroy it, understandably. Uh, the business world are Marxists. They are vulgar Marxists. Having <laughs> a vicious class war without a stop, values inverted, but basically Marxists. <laughs> and they don't stop for a minute. You go back to the Powell Memorandum, uh, change a couple of words, and it's uh, the little red book. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> it's, uh, they, they are class conscious. They know what they're doing. Uh, he says straight out, he says, look, we have the power, we own the country, we can force through what we want. Uh, we don't have to let these people peck away at our power. It's basically the Powell Memorandum. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, and the, the question is, is the other side going to give up? Well, the, at the political level, the, the Democratic Party partially, you know, it was a business party, of course, but it did partially reflect working class interests. That ended by the 70s. Hmm. Uh, the last gasp was the uh, uh, Humphrey Hawkins uh, uh, full employment bill, 1978. Uh, Carter, who was pretty anti-labor, didn't veto it, but he watered it down so it had no effect. It's just supposed to be voluntary. Uh, it's about the last gasp of the Democratic Party as far as the working class was concerned. So there's no, I mean, it's picked up again with the Sanders wing of the Democrats. But as you saw the last couple of years, the mainstream Democratic establishment, the party managers, they go all out to try to suppress it any way they can. And of course, by now the Republicans are not even, I mean, if you go back, the Republicans also supported the New Deal. Uh, Eisenhower, who was the last honest conservative in the country, uh, he strongly supported the New Deal. And you read his speeches today, they go way beyond Sanders. Mm -hmm. Anybody who doesn't support the New Deal doesn't belong in our political system, you know. Anyone who deprive, tries to deprive workers of their rights, just we don't want to hear from them. It's a small marginal group of crazies, you know. It's Eisenhower, uh, but uh, the neoliberal takeover has been ideological conquest, along with very effective class war. To go back to the fifty trillion dollar figure. It's not small change. Do you, do you feel hope or a sense of possibility with what we're seeing with unionization efforts 
these days? I mean, where where are you in terms of your 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 sense of possibility? Um, well, it's very interesting. Uh, there is a small growth of labor activism. A lot of it is outside the union movement. So you take a look at the uh, strike the teachers movement, for example. In red states like Arizona, where I live, the uh, teachers have been working very effectively to try to counter the destruction of, the, of public education. Remember that Arizona, Arizona is an interesting state. It's the test case for the right wing assault, going back to Friedman and others, to try to destroy the public education system. In fact, it's gone pretty far here. State legislature just passed uh, laws which basically offer people money to leave the public education system. Hmm. You get a voucher of $7,000 if you leave public education and do something else with it, you know, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, the education system is defunded. Uh, it's very well understood by the right that if you want to destroy a public institution, first defund it so it doesn't function. Then people get angry at it and say, okay, let's privatize and you make it worse over and over. So by now, Arizona, which is, which is not a poor state, has the second lowest expenditures for public education in the country, right after Mississippi. And, well, the teachers union is fighting against that. It's not a union, the teachers are fighting against that. <laughs> and they're getting a lot of public support. There are mass demonstrations and the legislature uh, uh, calling not only for improvement in wages, their very wages are much too low, but also improvement of education. They don't have to teach 40 kids in a third grade class. Let's have a reasonable class size. Let's have special education. Let's have uh, cultural art activities, sports and so on. Let's have a nurse on the premises. We're fighting for that. Plenty of support. When a referendum comes up, government overwhelmingly supports more aid to public education. Legislature run by the right-wing Republicans kills it. It's, uh, and they're getting a lot of public support. Yeah drive around Tucson, where I live. Uh, there are signs on people's houses saying, you know, support the teachers and so on. Uh, so there's a struggle. A lot of it outside the union movement. There's also some interesting victories inside, like Starbucks, Amazon. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a battle going on. There was a big GM strike, which did pretty well, but uh, total unionization is still going down and uh, militant labor activities basically flat. But outside the institutional structure, a lot's happening. And then there's also the major popular organizations like uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise Movement, others. Uh, these are all, these things are happening. It's uh, you know, it's, it's not organized, it's not centralized. It doesn't have the core labor movement at the center, as has always been true at the past. I think unless the labor movement is resuscitated, uh, it's gonna be very hard to do anything. Now, going back to the 1930s, that's a kind of model. The 1920s, uh, the labor movement had been almost totally destroyed, been wiped out by Wilson, Woodrow Wilson's repressive measures. There was almost nothing left of it. 30s began to reconstitute. CIO organizing, militant actions, as I said, a sympathetic administration. Did course, that take a crisis, an economic crisis, for that to happen, for that? It was that a terrible switch. economic crisis. 
also there was a fundamental difference. That's before the, at that point, the US was a essentially industrial economy, uh, had a solid industrial economy. And that's where the organizing took place. Mm -hmm. The uh, major in the industry is at the center of it. Well, that was destroyed by neoliberalism, which perf perfectly consciously deindustrialized the country. Now, this is mostly Clinton, incidentally, mm -hmm. picking up from the Republicans. Now, the uh, point of NAFTA and trade organization and so on was deindustrialize the country in the interests of the private owners, more class war. So, so now the industry is still there, but uh, nothing like what it was in the 30s, core of the economy, mm -hmm. a service financialized economy substantially, strongly supported by state intervention, couldn't survive otherwise. Yeah. So what would you say to to listeners if this is, I mean, you talk about the labor movement being at the heart of, at least in the past, always being at the heart of, you know, positive, progressive uh, change. And with the labor movement being so, um, I, I wouldn't call it moribund, but having been so uh, hampered and hurt for so long and it being harder now to organize because as you said it's not we don't have an industrial based economy anymore what would you say to listeners that is there means of intervention at this point what, what do people do in the context of what we face right now it depends who you are mm -hmm. if you're anywhere near the working class you can participate in direct organization i can't do that you know i can talk about it but i can't really participate in it but uh, and you can support it wherever it is and there's plenty being done outside the labor movement mm -hmm. supporting the teachers in arizona for example preventing the assault that is aiming to destroy public education now, there's a reason for that now, public education is something that brings people together as a community working together for the common good. Uh, the neoliberal ideal is to atomize people, separate them from one another. Mm -hmm. You look after yourself, don't worry about the next guy, uh, except for the rich and powerful. They, of course, work together, but for the rest, be atomized. Public education is a way to overcome that. I mean, say, my wife and I sent our kids to a public school. It's not just going to school together. Kids walk to school together. They make friends. They play together in the afternoons. They visit each other's homes. Neighbors get to know each other. Uh, you build a community which has community interests. That's very counter to the neoliberal ideal, which has to, which remember is class war. Actually, Marx understood this. He condemned the authoritarian leaders of Europe in his day for wanting to turn the population into what he called a sack of potatoes. Mm -hmm. Totally isolated, victims of power, can't get together to do anything out of it. Well, public education is part of that. Do we want a healthy community? Or do I just want to do the best that I can for myself? Uh, it's a very different attitude towards the world. Actually, we saw it interestingly during the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting to see around the world that in many places, including very poor places, deprived places, uh, neighborhood groups spontaneously coalesced to try to help people in the neighborhood. Uh, some old guy stuck in a room, can't get food, we'll bring him food. You know? mm -hmm. Sometimes it was done in the most amazing ways, like uh, in Brazil, uh, the favelas, the miserable slums, overrun by uh, gangs, uh, criminal gangs, uh, drug wars, and so on. Uh, 
the criminal gangs organized in the favelas. They arranged to bring people water to try to help them out and so on. Um, these spontaneous developments were pretty impressive. Uh, these are things that can be done at every level. Uh, so it's not, uh, there's, uh, there's not that there's any shortage of things to do. Rebuild communities, rebuild the consciousness that we're in it together, not fighting for a little more of the pie at the expense of the next guy. Uh, join together, you can work together. This goes all the way up to the federal level. So work, let's say, to turn the AOC Markey resolution into legislation. Work to overcome the uh, powerful effort by the far right to just crush any initiative that might help the country. I mean, we see it at every moment. Like, I take the, you read the newspaper today, points out that the ending of the pandemic relief funding from the government is driving a huge mass of people below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. well, it didn't have to happen with enough public support that could have been stopped. Yeah, let's, um, I really appreciate what you said about community and solidarity uh, and mutual aid and um, and it really struck me what you said about in your childhood and in the 30s how being part of like a union this was this was actually a community and a culture it wasn't simply you know uh, a nuts and bolts work environment type of situation so i think it does a lot of that does come back to relationship and connection um so I really, I really appreciate uh, those words, and I appreciate you taking the time, Noam, um, and for all your work over the years. Thanks very much. Good to talk to you. <laughs>